Okay, church, I am totally sorry. Uh, you've probably been wondering what in the world I've been doing, and to be honest, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, just about three minutes ago, my my internet went out, and and I don't know if it's if it's working or not. It's just totally bizarre. So uh, in the meantime, we're gonna do this a little rough, and uh, we're gonna do this old school. So probably no cool special effects. I'm not gonna be able to include anyone fun. I am so sorry, but we are still gonna worship the Lord as well as we can. And uh, I, wanna, I wanna give a big shout out to the Lopez's, Greg and Gina Lopez, as well as uh, little Joshua and Lily and Atlas. Uh, we were going to have them on, and uh, it's all on my end. For some reason, in the last 30 minutes, 25 minutes, I don't even know, my internet just died. And so I'm streaming this from my, my phone's internet right now. So hopefully T-Mobile holds out. Uh, if we had an advertisement today, we could say Southwest Christian Church is brought to you by T-Mobile. So I hope this is working, and uh, we're going to continue um, thank you, Ruben told me I am on. And I'm also totally unprepared, so all my devices are, are buzzing at me. <laughs> all right, back in the old drama days, when you broke character, what did you do? You were like, Phew. so that's what we're gonna do. Church, I, we're doing this live, so I'm begging for your prayers, begging for your support. Would you please join me in prayer? Lord, the fourth commandment has been on my heart all week, and that is to honor the Sabbath. And that's what we desire to do. As if it hasn't been a challenge enough to honor the Sabbath, to worship you, to make this day holy. Personally, God, it's, it's, uh, my brain is, is elsewhere. And so I desire your help. I desire your spirit. This is a reminder that we need you to be able to worship effectively. So God, would you give us hearts that are eager to worship you? Uh, God, I, I pray for um, technology. God, would you allow these things to work so that we can continue? Lord, thank you for your son. And despite all the craziness of everything, we now uh, want to celebrate him and celebrate his work. So we pray this all in your son's name. Amen. Church, I want to begin this morning hearing from Genesis 15. Genesis 15, this is a, a promise to God. It's from Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. If you would, please stand. I'm going ahead and read it now. Genesis 15, verses 1 to 6. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I'm your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very son shall be your heir. And he, be, and he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteous. That's what we're celebrating today faith in Christ, faith in what he's accomplished. And so we're going to continue in, in worship. And so as we lift up our hearts, uh, the Cahudos are going to lead us in song. And please join them in song wherever you're at. Uh, if, you, if you're at home, sing loud, make a joyful noise to the Lord. And, and let's celebrate vocally by giving praise to God. Again, I told you this isn't going to be pretty. This is going to be like an ugly Zoom conversation. I've got to push my phone to make things work. Good morning, church. Let's go ahead now and lift up our voices to honor and praise our King. Okay. 
Speak to us and help us to understand you more, to be closer to you, and just to continue to worship you through all our days. We love you and praise you. Just be with Luke now as he preaches your word. We all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You know, we've been running pretty smooth for a while, and then it seems like today uh, some of our techn t cool technological things just aren't working. But if anything, it's a, it's a reminder of what it means to approach God. It's a reminder of how we get to approach God. Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11 says, for, for while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person. No, perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his own love for us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now received reconciliation. And that's really what this is about. Today we're going to talk a lot about works, but these works are based off of what our faith is. And what is our faith? Our faith is that Jesus Christ died for us. Our faith is that he died for us on the cross. Our faith is that he died to, to save us from the wrath of God and to bring reconciliation to God as well. And that's, that's what our faith is. That's where it hinges on. And so everything that we're going to do the rest of today is based off this one groundbreaking truth that Jesus Christ is the only way. And wherever you are right now, in your homes, you're, you're, you've been patient this morning, let's make sure that that is why we do this. In fact, that needs to be our, our main goal. Colossians 3 says to set your minds on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And there are plenty of things in the world right now for us to be concerned about, maybe irritated about. But 
as Christians, we know that the things that we're irritated about or things that the world is concerned about, they're all temporary. I mean, really, they're temporary. What do we look forward to? We look forward to Christ returning. We look forward to one day being, being with God. That's what we celebrate. And we celebrate that because of the finished and accomplished work of Jesus. So church, let's set a moment aside now, reflect upon Christ, reflect upon what he's done, uh, spend some time in, in prayer, reflecting on him, and then I'm going to go ahead and, and close us. Heavenly Father, we're reminded that our, our hope comes from you. Our hope doesn't come from jobs. Our hope doesn't come from, from quarantine or not being quarantined. Our hope doesn't come even from our health. Our hope comes from you. Our hope is grounded in Jesus Christ. We know that each day is one day closer to being brought to you. And Lord, we recognize the sovereignty of your son. We recognize the work that he has done. In fact, the reason why we are Christians, the reason why we have hope is because we know that when your son died, he actually paid for sin. We know that you accepted his death because of his resurrection from the grave. That is what makes our hearts sing. That is what gets us up in the morning. Lord, would the rest of the service be pleasing to you, be honoring to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I said, uh, the Lopez family, Greg and Gina and Atlas, Lily and Joshua, uh, they were going to come on. I couldn't wait to, to bring them on. Uh, little Joshua's uh, almost five months old, and uh, what a great family. And, and, and to be honest, I mean, I was just looking at them. They're, they're in their living room. They're all dressed up. They're ready to go. And, and uh, Lopez family, I apologize uh, I really wanted to, to show you off, especially on Mother's Day. Church, I didn't forget it's Mother's Day. I just, my, my brain's been so scattered all over the place. Uh, wanted to, to say uh, happy Mother's Day to all of our moms. Um, this is a special one for Amanda and I, as this is our, our first Mother's Day with a kid. And I have a, a new appreciation for moms and, and what they do and watching my wife and how she takes care of our son, Ben. So to all of our moms that are there, uh, I, I adore you, I, I'm grateful for you, I celebrate all that you do, and uh, we, we've got a little video we want to show you. Uh, we had uh, the kids in our church all, all say a little message to their moms, and uh, I think you'll like what you see. So to all of our moms, to all of our families, here is a message from our kids. Mother's Day. Love you, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, Mommy. It's Mother's Day today, and I just want to say I love you and appreciate you. Love you. Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day, Day, Mom. We love you. Happy Mother's Day! We love you! Happy Mother's Day, Mom. We love you. Happy Mother's Day. We love you. Happy We are recording this video to tell you that we love you and that we appreciate everything that you do. We hope you have a good Mother's Day. We love, love you, Mama. Mama. Happy, Happy Mother's, Day. Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. I love you. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. I love you so, so much. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. We love you. We love you. Happy Mother's Day. Moms, we, we're grateful. 
uh, you know, one of those kids I was, uh, I was super excited to show off on there. But uh, moms, again, we are grateful for you. Husbands, I hope that you have a special day lined up for your wives. Hope that you're doing something to, to take care of them. Uh, a couple announcements for you and just some things to clear up. Um, first, on Friday, uh, the Riverside County, um, I don't know, people, <laughs> uh, the Riverside County uh, re uh, loosened some of their orders on us. And, and I think that some of you may be wondering, does that mean we're allowed to start worshiping in a building? Trust me, I would love that more than anything, especially today. But actually, no, it doesn't mean that at all. Uh, what had happened was Riverside County had actually ordered stricter orders than the state. Uh, they had uh, closed things like golf courses and things like that. But Riverside County had also ordered uh, people to socially distance. So uh, technically it was illegal to be in a store less than six people from someone. And you also had to wear a mask when in stores. So on Friday, Riverside County removed those orders. They said you no longer have to be socially distant and you no longer have to wear a mask, but they, they cannot go further than the governor's order, which says that we have to, we're still sheltered in place, which is what they're calling it. So until the governor says we're allowed to go outside our homes for things other than Costco, Walmart, you know, on, on the list goes, um, we're still under house arrest, shelter in place, whatever you want to call it. So, um, so and, and, and by the way, just because the county removed the order to wear masks, that doesn't mean stores aren't going to require it. So uh, don't go into a store without a mask and, and yell at the manager at Albertsons um, because they can still have their own rules that they're probably going to enact. So we're still at home. But uh, the elders and myself, we, we met on Zoom Thursday evening uh, to talk about this. And um, at this time, we're, we're going to still cooperate. We're still going to follow the law. Um, we're hoping that this comes soon, comes to an end soon. Um, but so we're still going to be doing this online. We're still going to be doing things virtually. But uh, we do want to start exploring new ways to promote fellowship with us. Uh, one of those ways, that we don't, I don't have any information for you yet other than a date and an idea of what we're going to do. Uh, May 31st, it's the last Sunday of this month, we're going to have a, a communion and worship service and we're going to do it uh, at the church, um, but we're going to do it outside in our cars. So, so May 31st in the evening time, uh, drive on down to the church and we're going to have a communion service and uh, spend some time in worship from our cars. Um, which is legal. That is legal. We're not breaking any laws. Also, we got some special stuff coming up. I believe I said this in my weekly email this past week. Uh, Donna is going to be uh, planning and pursuing VBS. That's going to be June 15th through the 19th. It's going to be a virtual VBS. Uh, so we're going to be doing it through YouTube and, and different videos. Um, and registration is now live. If you go to the church's website, southwestchristianchurch.org, uh, there's a link right on the main page that'll take you there to start registering. And this Tuesday, uh, Donna and I will have a special message that we'll pass on to you. So look for your email Tuesday evening, and you can learn a little bit more about VBS and how to be involved in it. Uh, we still have plenty of activities that we're doing. We're using Zoom for uh, Bible studies, group fellowship, things like that. So today at 10.30, Randy is going to be teaching through the attributes of God. Tonight at 6 p.m., we have a prayer meeting. Um, I, I would love for you to be there. It's encouraging to, to see each other there. Wednesday, uh, we're going through 1 Corinthians, and links for all of that are included in the weekly email. Or uh, if, if you don't know how to get there, you can also go on to Southwest Christian Church. Dot org. There's a, a box on the right-hand side that says coming events, and in those coming events, it'll show you, uh, there, there's actually links that'll take you to the different groups, or another way is here on Facebook, uh, posts go out regularly. I think one was posted yesterday at about four o'clock that includes links to different things. So please be involved. Please be involved. I, I realize we can't see each other, but we are still doing things, and I love to see you. And when you show up for things, turn on your cameras, um, because I, I want to see you. I don't want to see whatever 
letter your name begins with. I don't want to see a giant black box. I want to see your beautiful face. I don't care if you haven't shaved in a month, men or women. <laughs> and uh, also we appreciate your giving. Uh, church, this is a, an amazing time. It's a difficult time. I know many churches are struggling, and church, you have been faithful. So we, we hope that you would continue to be faithful in giving of your gifts. Uh, you can give gifts uh, either by writing checks and mailing them to the church or by finding us on Venmo. Uh, just look for Southwest Christian. You'll find our logo there, and you can give your gifts, and they go directly to the church. Um, and there's, there's no added fees there. If you have any questions, please contact Jason Taylor for all of that. And uh, church, we're going to segue. We're going to move on forward into this morning's message. So would you please join me in prayer as we go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your word, which uh, teaches us how to have faith, teaches us what you expect of faith. And so now as we open your word, I pray not just for understanding, but I pray, Lord, that we would put what we understand into action. Would you give us an idea? Would you give us a realization of what real faith is? And then would we live victoriously in you? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, church, there once was a a magical place called Duckland. Duckland was a, was a country filled with ducks. And every Sunday morning, all the ducks of Duckland would dutifully go to church. They would go to church and they would waddle into the doors of their familiar church. They would waddle to their regular pews and squat down in their regular spots. They would do church. The duck church would sing their familiar duck songs and and at the end of singing their duck songs, their duck pastor would waddle up to his pulpit and he would open up his duck Bible and he would read and he would preach. And this duck pastor would say, ducks, you have wings. Use your wings to fly. Use your wings to fly high like the eagles. With your wings, you can soar to the sky. You can fly if only you use your wings. And that mallard duck would preach a powerful sermon. And the ducks that were there that day, they would hear the sermon and they would be moved and they would quack a hearty amen. In fact, some of the ducks even made decisions to fly. And then when the duck service was over, these ducks who were just told about the magnificent life that they could have flying in the sky, these ducks would waddle their way home. Laying their wings on their back, they would just do that familiar duck waddle back home. They could have flown. They could have put what they heard into action, but instead they waddled. You know what that is? That's foolishness. It's foolishness to affirm something and then to live as if you didn't know it. It's foolishness to, to know something and then do nothing about what you know. And that Duckland Church, it's it's not so different from many churches today. We read God's word. We study God's word. And oftentimes we're, we're moved by God's word. We have emotions from God's word. We, we hear a sermon that moves us and we say amen. In fact, sometimes even after sermons, we make decisions. We say, this is what I'm going to do. But we remain the same. We, we, we say, I believe it, but I don't need it. Sometimes limiting obedience or, or limiting our actions to only verbally affirming something but never doing something about it. And then we waddle home just like those ducks. James understood this well. And that's what brings us to today's passage. We're in James chapter 2. We're going to go ahead and look at James 2 verses 20 to 26. So if you would go ahead and open up your Bibles to James chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 20 to 26. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that apart from, 
uh, from works uh, that that faith apart from works is useless useless verse 21 was not abraham our father justified when he offered up his son isaac on the altar you see that faith was active along with his works and faith was completed by his works and the scripture was fulfilled that says abraham believed god and it was counted to him as righteousness and he was called a friend of god you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. James recognized this problem. He recognized the problem that there are people who say, yes, I believe, yes, I have faith, and that's as far as their Christian life goes. Did you catch what James calls the person who says he has faith but does nothing? Who says he has faith but needs to do nothing else? Verse 20, he says, do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that apart from works, faith works is useless? What does he call the person who who affirms something and does nothing about it, he says, you foolish person. Those ducks in Duckland, they knew they could fly, but how did they get around town? They, they waddled around town. What is that? That's foolishness. You believe that Jesus is Lord, that he has commanded us to obey him, and then you turn your nose on him? What is that? That's foolishness. Look at what James says at the end of verse 20, he says, faith apart from works is useless. Faith apart from works is useless. That The word that we see for useless, it actually means workless. <laughs> I know that sounds weird to say the word workless because I don't, I don't think I've ever used that word, but that's what it means. It means it's workless. It means it, it doesn't work. Maybe you can say it's broken. Faith without works is broken. That is a, a broken faith. It is a, a defective faith faith. A couple of weeks ago, it started warming up. I believe one day I went driving, my car said it was 99 degrees outside. It got really warm. And man, and I turned on our air conditioner for the first time, and who knows how long. And, and we could hear the fan blowing in our house. We could hear the fan, and we could feel the air, but it wasn't cold air. Our fan was just blowing hot air through the house. The, the air conditioner unit outside it it wasn't working. The air conditioner was broken. How do we know that? Because there was no cold air. An air conditioner with, cold, with no cold air is a broken air conditioner. It's a workless air conditioner. And faith without works is broken. So James says, let me show you what I mean. Now, up until now, James has been giving us negative examples. He's given us examples kind of like the, the church in Duckland. He's given us negative examples. He's given examples of people who didn't have works. He's given examples of broken faith. At the start of chapter 2, he described a church that shows partiality, that gave favor to the rich man over the poor man. Last week, we saw an example of someone who was lacking. It says he was naked, he was cold, he was hungry. And what did the church say? They said, you go. You go and warm yourself. You go and feed yourself. That is a dead faith. But now James is going to become the optimist. He's going to change gears on us. He's going to give us examples of living faith. And so he's going to give us three examples of a living faith. And the first example of a living faith is actually Abraham's faith. You see this in verses 21 to 24. He says, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. In order to understand what James is talking about here, because this, is, this has been a, a passage that has really confused a lot of people throughout the ages. In order to understand what James is talking about, we need to understand what Abraham's faith is like. So if you would, go ahead and turn back in your Bibles to Genesis 15. 
I read to you from Genesis 15 at the start of the service, shortly after I composed myself from having a mental breakdown because the internet wasn't working. Genesis 15 is, is where we'll start. Before I dive into Genesis 15, let me just give a, a little recap of what brings us into Genesis 15. In Genesis 12, God makes a promise to Abraham. Genesis 12, 1 through 3 is something we call the Abrahamic covenant. So Genesis 12, 1 through 3, God gives promises to Abraham. God promises that he would bless Abraham and that from Abraham, Abraham would become a mighty nation, a great nation. But there was a problem that Abraham was facing. The problem is that Abraham had no children. He, he, was, he was old. In fact, he was well past the age of having children. But God's promise was Abraham, you will have a child. And your children will become a mighty nation. That was the promise in Genesis 12. Genesis 14, there was a war, a war near Sodom and Gomorrah. And in that war, Abraham's nephew, his name was Lot, nephew, his, his family, and all his possessions, they were, they were kidnapped. They were taken hostage. Abraham hears about it. Now, Abraham is not the leader of a nation. He's, he's just a super wealthy man who hires lots of people with him. So Abraham takes the men that are with him and he gathers his forces and Abraham goes to war against those who had kidnapped his nephew Lot. He goes to war and he ends up saving the day. Abraham rescues Lot. He rescues the people that were with Lot. He retrieves Lot's possessions. But it was a, a harrowing experience. I mean, here's Abraham, he's an old man, and what is he doing? He's going to war. Abraham is an old man going to war. And then we come to Genesis 15. Genesis, Genesis 15 is, is just starting. Abraham's just come out of a, a war, and he's wondering if God's promise was real. He's just come out of a battle. Abraham is an old man fighting wars. Wars are, are deadly. People die in wars. I mean, what if Abraham had died in that war? What if he had died rescuing Lot? Abraham would have died childless. He would have, he would have died childless without anyone. And yet God's promise was that Abraham would become the father of a great nation. And here's Abraham fighting wars in deadly situations. And he's wondering who's going to be the heir Currently, his heir was a, was a butler. His name was Eliezer. His, his heir was the head of his household, was the main servant of his household. That's who's going to have it. So now in Genesis 15, verses 2 through 3, Abraham asks for clarification. Abraham says, says But Abraham said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my people is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. So there's the problem. Abram's old. He's, he's only getting older. He's been in, in deadly conflicts. He says, I have no kids. Am I supposed to pass on my inheritance to Eliezer? Is, is that who it's supposed to be? And I love God's response. Genesis 15, verses 4 through 5. God says, this man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven. Number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. God makes it clear. Eliezer, the, the household servant, that is not who's going to be the heir. God makes it clear. Abraham will have a son. Abraham will have a son, and this literal son, this actual son, will become the heir. God has made promises to Abraham, and those promises will be fulfilled through an actual son of Abraham's. And what about the nation? There's this tender moment. God takes him outside, and he says, look at the stars. So they go outside, they look at the stars. It's a clear, dark night. The sky is lit up with sparkling, twinkling, shining, heavenly lights. And God says, number them if you're able to. That's how many children you'll have. Here we go. Now, what did Abraham do? 
Look at verse 6. Verse 6 says, And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. That verse, Genesis 15, 6, becomes one of the most important verses in all the Bible. Paul quotes from it twice within his own writings. So here's Abraham wondering, is God's promise real? And how does Abraham respond? Abraham has faith. He has faith. Abraham's faith was that God would give him a child. And this child that Abraham would have would become the head of a nation. And this nation would become so large, they would be like stars in the sky. That was his faith. Now, how do we know Abraham had faith? Well, the ducks in Duckland, they said they could fly, but they didn't show they knew how to fly because they waddled through Duck Town, wondering if they could really fly or not. You, you wonder if the ducks in Duckland really believed what they said. So back to Abraham, how do we know if Abraham believed? How do we know if he really had faith? Because it's easy to say, Lord, I believe you, and do nothing about it. That's what James refers to in James 2, verses 21 to 22. What James is referring to in James 2, 21 to 22, was the demonstration of Abraham's faith. What James is referring to in James 2 is the proof of Abraham's faith, the, the action of Abraham's faith. That's why James says, Was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered up his son on the altar? He says, You see that faith was active along with works. And faith was completed by his works. He says that Abraham was justified by his works when he offered up his son. And that happens in Genesis 22. So now, in your Bibles, go ahead and flip forward to Genesis 22. Back in Genesis 15, God had made this massive promise to God. God had made this massive promise to, God, or to Abraham that Abraham would have a son. Eventually and miraculously, Abraham and Sarah have a son in their old age. This son's name is Isaac. Isaac was the son of promise. And God made it clear that Isaac was the one who the future depended on. Isaac was the one that the future hinged on. And now here's Abraham. Abraham was about 100 years old when Isaac was born. And by the time we get to Genesis 22, Abraham is at least 120. Isaac was probably an adult. And Abraham is probably 120 years old. If you're in Genesis 22, look at verse two. Look at the first two verses. It says, after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on the mountain of which I shall tell you. Now this is a huge moment. I, I hope you see the gravity of this moment, the, the importance of this moment. Isaac is the promised son. There, there is no confusion about that. The future, the, the future of Abraham's lineage, the future of Abraham's dynasty, the future of Israel depends upon Isaac's survival, depends upon Isaac becoming old enough to find a wife of his own and have his own children. And yet, what has God just commanded Abraham? God has just commanded Abraham, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and offer him as a burnt offering. Offer him as a burnt offering. That means Isaac needs to die. But if Isaac dies, then what about the promise? The, the promise is, is over. If there is no Isaac, then there's no promise. Now, many of us ask, why would God do this? Verse 1 tells us why. God was testing him. And what is it that God could be testing? Abraham's faith. God is testing what Abraham said he believed back in Genesis 15. Back in Genesis 15, God made it clear that Abraham would have a son and that the son Isaac would, would become a nation that was comparable to the stars in the sky. 
Genesis 15, 6 says, And he believed the Lord and counted it to him as righteousness. Abraham believed that God would do exactly that. And then we move to Genesis 22, and God tells Abraham to take his son Isaac, go to a mountain, and sacrifice his son. So Abraham and Isaac take the long journey. They find the spot that the Lord leads them to. Abraham builds an altar. Abraham takes his adult son and ties him up. Abraham lays the wood on top of Isaac. And then Abraham reaches for his knife, raises his arm, and, and he's just about to slaughter Isaac in the same way that he'd slaughtered so many animals before. And he's just about to, to apply that knife to Isaac's neck when the angel of the Lord, by the way, that's Jesus Christ, when the angel of the Lord appears and says, Abraham, Abraham, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Many people read this story, and, and there's always this wonder, like, would Abraham really have done it? Would, would he really have done it? Would he really have slaughtered his son? Or was he looking over his shoulder the whole time as if, you know, he's been dared. I dare you to do it. He's like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. You know, was, was he really going to do it? I, it? I think he was really going to do it. And it's a good thing that Jesus, the angel of the Lord, intervened because Abraham was not going to stop. He was going to slaughter his son just like a sheep. Why? Because Abraham believed. He believed. It wasn't that he hated his son. It was, this wasn't even just some random thing of violence. No, this was actually motiv motivated because Abraham had faith. Abraham was willing to obey God and sacrifice his son because he believed in the promises of God. Abraham's action in Genesis 22 confirmed that he had faith in the promises that God had made to him back in Genesis 15. And what exactly was Abraham's faith? What was it that he thought would happen? Well, according to Hebrews 11, verse 19, Abraham believed that God would bring Isaac back from the dead. That's how sure Abraham was of God's promise. Abraham was told that Isaac would become the head of a nation. And yet God called for Abraham to slaughter his son Isaac. Now some of us see a contradiction there. You might be sitting there seeing a contradiction going, well, what is it? Is it kill your son or is it that son's going to be the head of a nation? But in Abraham's mind, he, he had already worked it out. He'd already figured it all out. There was no contradiction. He believed that yes, the promise was through Isaac. So therefore, if God commanded him to kill Isaac, then God would bring Isaac back from the grave. That was his hope. His, his faith, his, his confidence was so sure that he knew that if Isaac died, the Lord would bring him back to life and Isaac would still fulfill the promise. So Abraham's faith was made known because of his actions in Genesis 22. In fact, we would never have been sure about Abraham's faith if we didn't have Genesis 22. And because of his actions, we learn three things Three things from Abraham's faith. We learn three things. Verse 21 says that Abraham was justified by works. Now this is where this passage has thrown people for a, a huge loop. Verse 21, when it says he was justified by his works, it doesn't mean that he was saved by his works. He was assured salvation because of the promises from God. These were God's promises, so that was, that was where salvation came from. So he, he wasn't saved because of his works. The word for justify here, though many times it means to be declared innocent, it can also mean to, to give evidence, to, to give a testimony to the reality of something. So really, James or Abraham is giving a testimony to the reality of his faith. Back in Genesis 15, it was said that he had faith, and he was declared righteous. In Genesis 22, Abraham was doing the deeds of a righteous man. A righteous man obeys God. A righteous man will live righteously. And for those of you who are in Christ, 
you are righteous. Do you know that? Do you know that because of Jesus Christ's perfect life, that his righteousness has been imputed to you. It now covers your entire life. And because his righteousness has been imputed to you, you are now righteous. And if you have been declared righteous, how do you live? You live righteously. You live a, a holy life. And as you live a holy life, your faith is justified. Your, your faith is made known because of your works. Your righteous living is the fruit, it is the evidence that you are indeed connected to the vine. I've got a tree in my front yard, and uh, once or twice a year I've got to trim the branches. And as long as branches are connected to the trunk of that tree, they're going to grow, they're going to keep growing, they're going to have off branches, and they're going to have leaves, and it's going to grow out of control. But the moment they're severed from it, They no longer get the nutrients from the trunk, and they die. When a branch is connected to the tree, it flourishes. And your evidence is you flourishing, and your righteousness is evidence that you are connected to Christ. The second principle that we see of Abraham's faith is that we learn that faith matures. Faith grows as you go through life. Look at verse 22. Verse 22 says, you see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. When did Abraham have faith? Genesis 15. That's when he had faith. Genesis 15. When was that faith completed? Genesis 22. The idea of faith being made known and then being completed is a huge theme in this little book of James. It's a huge theme. Back in Genesis 1, verses 2 through 4, James says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That's the same language. Your faith should never remain stagnant. In fact, your faith shouldn't remain as it was when you were first converted. Faith changes. Faith grows. I mean, wouldn't it be nice if you became a Christian and suddenly you you instantly knew it all? Wouldn't it be nice if, if you became a Christian, the Holy Spirit came into your heart, and suddenly you could recall every verse in the Bible from memory? Oh, that'd be awesome. But it doesn't work that way. The Christian life is much like the human experience. One thing I've been surprised about with being a father and being a parent and taking care of Ben are the simple things that we have to teach Ben. I'm surprised. Simple things, as simple as sleep. Uh, Amanda has has put together this, this great schedule, this great routine, so that Ben, our son, can can sleep. Since February, we've gotten full nights of sleep. <laughs> we, we don't wake up in the middle of the night having to feed him or change the diapers or rock him back to sleep or any of that kind of stuff. Ben sleeps all night long. Why is that? Because we've taught him to sleep. We've, we, we've began teaching him how to eat. And it's interesting. I mean, I, I just thought you just kind of put food in his mouth and he figures it out. But no, we, we start with baby food. And I'll tell you what, it's hilarious watching him make spit bubbles out of sweet potatoes. And it's a disgusting mess. But it's part of the process, teaching him how to eat. He's learning how to to make sounds. And it's funny how every couple of days he learns a new sound, whether it's learning to yell or learning to to make sounds in the back of his throat or in the front of his mouth. He's he's making all sorts of sounds, trying out sounds. And then at some point, he's going to combine all these sounds and start making words. And then I expect I'll be telling him to be quiet and stop using all those sounds. There are certain things that that we have to teach him. And the same with the Christian life. You you study God's word. You learn God's word. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.15 says that we are to show ourselves approved. Because it doesn't just magically come to us. Titus chapter 1 verse 9 says of elders that they need to have been taught and that they teach others. Why? Because our faith grows as we go through life. You don't begin knowing it all. Our faith changes. We don't stay the same. In Philippians 1 6, Paul says, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work 
in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. So faith continues to grow. And, and look at your life and, and, and strive to grow. The third thing that we learn of Abraham's faith is that he was called a friend of God. Sometimes when talking about Christianity, people will sometimes say that, that what we have is not a religion, but a relationship. Have you ever heard someone say that? It's not a religion, it's a relationship. And they're kind of right. I, I'm not, I don't like the language, they're kind of right. Yes, this is a relationship, but it's also a religion. <laughs> we, we do worship, we have ordinances, we, we have religious activities, but it's also a relationship. And James talks about the relationship that Abraham had with God. James 2.23 says, and the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. It says, and he was called a friend of God. Unfortunately, when people talk about Christianity being a relationship, not a religion, they're really speaking more like James' opponents. James' opponents said all you need to do is say you have faith and there's no expectation of obedience. But the relationship that Abraham had with God was not just Abraham saying, oh yeah, there's God, he's my best friend, but it was one where there was faith, and that faith was made known in his evidence. And Jesus speaks the same way. In fact, one of the strongest verses in the Bible that describes this relationship that we have with God is John 15, 13. It's one of my favorite verses. John 15, 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for my friends. Isn't that great? The, the greatest love is when someone lays down his life for his friends. And, and that's what Christ has done. Christ has laid down his life for who? For his friends. And, and people who love the relational aspect of Christianity say, there you go. Christianity is all about having a relationship. But Genesis 15, 4, or John 15, 14, the very next verse says this. You are my friends if you do what I command. An obedient faith proves that you have a relationship with God. If you are a friend of God, then the evidence of that relationship is obedience to him. If you are a friend of God, then there will be works. You believe what God's word says, you trust what God's word says, and then you act on what God's word says. So that's Abraham, and Abraham's where we spend a large chunk of our time. We have two more examples. The second example of a living faith is Rahab. Look at verses 24 to 25. It says, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? I'm, I'm really glad that we have James. I'm glad that James uses the examples that he gives. He gives Abraham, and Abraham is, is a man of privilege. I mean, Abraham was a wealthy man. He was a powerful man. Uh, he wasn't a nation, but he did take on other nations in battle. Uh, he was blessed by God. In fact, it's easy to look at Abraham and, and say, well, of course Abraham had faith. Nothing bad ever happened to the guy. It's easy to say, well, of course Abraham was able to believe. He was so blessed by God, there was never really any test, any challenge. So James gives us Rahab as a second example. Rahab was completely different. Where Abraham had faith and was counted to him as righteous, what was Rahab? She was a pagan woman living in a pagan town. Rahab was from the town of Jericho. Jericho was uh, about 200 years old by the time we meet her in Joshua 2. Jericho was one of the first fortified cities. It had massive walls that went around the entire town. Jericho was a proud town. They were proud of these walls. They knew that there was no way they were ever going to get conquered. Nothing could bring them to their knees. Within this proud town was a prostitute named Rahab. And this prostitute was much like the town she lived in. She was immoral. She was not a follower of God. She was not privileged. She had a house that was built into the walls of the town, and this house was also where her business was. So the house was probably kind of like a hostel, like, a, like, a, like an inn, as well as like a brothel where she held her business. 
So the book of Joshua begins with Israel about to enter into the promised land. And Joshua sends two spies into Jericho to spy out the town. They didn't go very far. They just made it beyond the walls and they came to Rahab's house. The people of Jericho heard that some Hebrew spies had infiltrated the land. So they start looking for the spies. Jericho sends, the city of Jericho sends some people to Rahab's house. And they question Rahab about the Hebrew spies. And maybe you remember what Rahab did, what she, told, what she did. She hid the Hebrew spies on the roof of her home, and then she let them over the side of the wall by a rope. But before she let the spies out, she gave this statement, this confession of faith. In Joshua 2, 9 through 11, it says, I know that the Lord has given you the land and the fear of you, and that the fear of you has fallen upon us. Now all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens, above the heavens, and, above the heavens and the earth beneath. Now, how do we know that Rahab believed those words? How do we know she really had faith? James says she was justified by what? By works. Her faith was evident because of what she did. Her faith, she she vocalized having a fear of God, and that fear of God was made known because of what she did to the Hebrew spies. She accepted the spies she hid the spies, and then she sent them out the window, sent them out another way. Now, if she didn't have faith, if she didn't think God was really going to destroy Jericho, she would have just handed the spies over to those looking for them. But as it stands, she had faith, and her faith was demonstrated in her actions, or to use James' language, she was justified by her works. Her works showed what she believed. And together, when we look at Rahab and Abraham, these two stand as pillars of the faith. They have a legacy of faith. In fact, they're mentioned in Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 is often called the Faith Hall of Fame. You go to Hebrews if you want to learn about people who had faith. Hebrews 11 mentions men and women who had great faith. But what's amazing is when you look at Hebrews 11 and you read of people by faith, their faith is never mentioned all by itself. It doesn't say Rahab had faith and Abraham faith and Moses had faith. It actually says the person, it says they had faith, and it says what they did to demonstrate that faith. It is the way we use the word faith is of blind, hopeful optimism. The way Hebrews uses faith is that it is an expression of what we believe. So, for example, Hebrews 11 says that by faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice. Abel had faith. And how did Abel demonstrate that faith? By offering a more acceptable sacrifice. By faith, Noah constructed an ark. How do we know that Noah had faith? Because he built an ark. By faith, Abraham obeyed. By faith, Jacob invoked blessings. By faith, Jacob blessed each of the sons of Joseph. By faith, Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Hebrews 11 isn't a list of just optimism. Hebrews 11 is a list of people who had faith, and that faith was always accompanied by an action. Do you have faith? What is your faith? It cannot be just something that you verbalize. If we are going to use the example from Scripture, your faith must be put to action. Now, in the context of James 2, James 2 has been talking about the royal law. Do you remember what the royal law is? It's to love your neighbor as yourself. That's what started this whole thing, was there were people who said they had faith, but they didn't obey the royal law. So when we were talking about work, specifically in James 2, it's, it's obeying God. It's obeying Christ. It's, it's caring for others. And, and I cannot stress this enough, but we must have healthy relationships with each other. We, we must, especially while we're sheltering at home or under house arrest, however you want to call it. 
If, if we're not able to see each other, we've, we've got to strive to have relationships. Because the relationships that we have at church, within the church, they can't be based off of convenience. A relationship based off of convenience is a relationship that you have just because you happen to be around the person at the same time. If we are going to be a body, if we are going to be a community, then we must be aggressive in maintaining these relationships. Church, don't put your relationships on autopilot. Don't wait for the other person to contact you. You contact them. You reach out to them. Then the third very brief example of a living faith is found in verse 26. The third example of a living faith is an illustration of the human body. Look at verse 26. It says, For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. This is his third example of faith. It's also the conclusion to the section in chapter 2. How do you tell if a body is alive? It, it breathes. It, it breathes. If you aren't sure someone is alive or not, you, you get close to their face and you, you see if there's any breath. Maybe you watch their chest to see if it goes up or down. You, you check for a pulse because there's, there's activity within a body that proves if the body is alive or not. There is evidence, and if there is no evidence of life, then you say the body is dead. And that's what James is getting at here. A body with no breath is dead, and a body with no works or a person with no works has a dead faith. And if faith doesn't have works along with it, then it's a broken faith. It's a defective faith. It really is no faith. It's interesting. James, little book of James, five chapters, is filled with the most commands, the most imperatives in the New Testament. Only has 108 verses, but it has 61 imperatives. Imperatives are things that you're told to do. And yet, I am firmly convinced that James is a book about faith. James describes Faith in simple terms. If you want to know what faith is, read James. Because James tells us this is what faith looks like. This is how you have faith. So if you want to know what God expects of you, read James. Back to Duckland. Those, those poor ducks in Duckland. They waddled in and out of church every week. And they never flew they never used those wings that they were given. They were never doing what they were created to do because their faith was nothing more than a preference that sometimes was demonstrated in emotions. Church, your purpose isn't to waddle like a duck. It really is to soar like an eagle. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 31 says, But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. God has plans for you that go beyond sadly, sadly waddling through life. God gives the gift of joy. So, God gives the gift of, of faith. So if you have received faith, according to Romans 12, that faith has been given to you. According to Ephesians 2, that faith is a gift of God. It's something that's given to you. So you have faith. That faith, you find hope in Him. You find joy in Him. You find security in Him. Amen. That is all good. So you have that because of faith. And now you act on it. You fly. You fly. God hasn't saved you to waddle through life. He has gifted you with faith. And that faith is then to be demonstrated in your works. To work properly. He has given you faith. And that, that faith is to work effectively. Ephesians 2.10 says... For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Church, you have been given a new life in Christ Jesus. You've been given a new life, so show it. And just a hint, showing your faith is not posting a meme on Facebook or on Instagram. That's not what it means to show your faith. Showing your faith is seen in your relationships. When you pursue Christians who are drifting away, when you pursue others that you are having trouble with, when you are loving the lowest, when you're loving the outcast, showing your faith is blessing those who curse you, 
Showing your faith is praying for your enemies. Showing your faith is seeking reconciliation. Showing your faith is living obediently to the glory of God. Church, that is what we have been saved to do. You're in your home. You know your life better than I do. All I can say is it's time to stop waddling. And it's time to live the faith that God has given you. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I think of the word stagnant. Would you keep us from being stagnant, but would we be a, an active church be filled with an active faith because we have the living God inside of us? Lord, keep us from hypocrisy. Keep us from, from stagnancy. Instead, by your spirit, would we grow and would that growth be made evident when we do the works that you have prepared beforehand? We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Church, I, I said this earlier, but all this faith that we have, it's, it's the result of Christ's work on the cross. His work does something. And, and if you believe Christ to be Lord, then I hope that it's evident. Well, that's all the, the time that I have. Again, I, I'm grateful. Thank you for being patient. Sorry for the weird technical troubles. My microphone might have been on. I, I might have even been panicking earlier. I was panicking earlier. <laughs> uh, have a great, great Mother's Day. I'm going to close with the benediction. Then after the benediction, I'm going to play the Mother's Day video one more time in case, in case you missed it. And then we will see you at Christians University. Uh, we're a little late. So uh, Randy, if you're watching this, how about we start in about 15 minutes, uh, 10, 1040, uh, just so people have time to stretch, go to the bathroom, move their kids. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Again, to our moms, thank you. And have a great Mother's Day. Mother's Day. Love you, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, Mommy. It's Mother's Day today, and I just want to say I love you and appreciate you. Love you. Uh, happy, happy Mother's, Mother's Day, Day, Mom. Mom. We love you. Happy Mother's Day! We love you! Happy Mother's Day, Mom. We love you. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. We love you. Happy Mother's Day. Mom, we are recording this video to tell you that we love you and that we appreciate everything that you do. We hope you have a good Mother's Day. We love, love you, Mama. Mama. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. I love you. Happy love Mother's you. Day, Mom. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. I love you so, so much. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. We love you. We love you. Happy 